I'm here. In this place. You're not going to get away scot free. <laughs> somewhere around $35,000. Oh, okay. But to me, it signals something different, and that is a commitment of Apple to the Macintosh computer. Okay. So that, that's a good sign. I, will I buy a Mac Pro? No, I'll probably wait 15 years and get one off of the dumpster. 
Yeah. Uh, some of the other things that they did was they uh, made the announcement that they would be doing a new operating system for the Macintosh computer. It's going to be called Carolina. Catalina. 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 Excuse me. Catalina. Yeah, the island. Not the yeah, state. it's in California. Catalina. <laughs> Off the coast. Uh, and it's so you know again they're showing their commitment to continuing to work with the Macintosh computers. They took the operating system for the iPads. You know, your iPads today run iOS, which was an abbreviation for iPhone OS. And the iPads are going forward going to have their own version of the operating system called iPad OS. So you've got Mac OS, and the Mac is all lowercase. iPad OS, iPads lower, OS is capital. You've got Watch OS, TV OS, what am I missing? IOS. And iOS, which is for the iPhone. And I'm going to go out on the limb and suggest that next year they'll then start calling it iPhone OS instead of iOS. Because they'll have them all separated out. Um, a whole bunch of development stuff that they did. Well, before you leave that, yeah. uh, will there be barriers in between them, or will they communicate uh, freely between each of these business centers? <clears throat> Basically, what they're doing is setting up independent profit centers. Yeah. Um, uh, and sometimes the, the connectivity that we all started using Apple was the advantage. Okay. It has tended to disappear. Okay, so two things. Bad news and good news. One of the reasons why you start to segment out your industry is so you can shut down one of them without affecting the others. Okay, so that's the bad news. Remember, I used to work for a newspaper. Okay. Uh, the good news is there was also a programming development product called Catalyst that was not only announced, but was deployed to the developers. What that lets them do is build an application and then tell Catalyst what platform they want it to be optimized for. Do they want it on an iPhone? Do they want it on an iPad? Do they want it on a watch? Do they want it on a Mac? Which means you can theoretically build an app once and deploy it to all four devices. That, to me, indicates that you're going to continue to have that communication between devices. So that's the good news. Now we'll just see if they can execute and implement the plan. That's that's where the details get. I, iCloud will still be around to to bridge between all of the different devices. Correct. Yeah, but they may not be interoperable. Uh, well, I was going to wait for my help desk for on this. The iPhone just changed the OS this spring. Mm -hmm. When it changed the OS, if you had something like that. Uh, AOL. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, you weren't getting your mail on the mail app for Apple. AOL wants you to use, or Apple wants you to use a separate AOL app. Actually, AOL wants you or to use AOL. a separate so AOL app. And they got a push system now, so every two or three minutes, you're getting a, a push signal. Okay. Uh, and if you're hooked up now to an internet supplier, that's treated as data. Yep. And so you're getting charged something. Yep. And so the whole system has all of a sudden changed. Okay. You have twigged to what's actually going on. It's not a technical challenge. It's a financial challenge. Yes, it's a business case. That's, that's the point yeah. I'm trying to make. Okay. The reason why, oh, first of all, just remember, who owns AOL? Oh, you all failed the quiz. Verizon owns AOL. Who owns Yahoo? Verizon owns Yahoo. Okay. What is Verizon known for doing for its shareholders? Dividends and increased book value consistently over 35 years for their shareholders. Okay. So now that they own Yahoo and AOL, Yahoo and AOL are expected to start adding into that. If you're using the AOL app to do your AOL mail, AOL gets the revenue for whatever advertisements show up in that app. Okay, so it's a revenue stream. 
How do you get people to move from the Apple Mail program to the AOL Mail program? You make a few little things so that the Apple Mail program doesn't work quite as well. And then Apple responds, and then it works okay, and then it doesn't, and then it doesn't. Okay, on the help desk, tell us how we can get back to you to the Apple mail instead of the AOL. Okay, okay. All right, so somebody keep me honest and remind me of that one. Yes, iTunes, iTunes also changed. Ooh. Oh, yeah, well, iTunes is going to echo to three business Okay. Centers. Now, I don't want to sound like a certain talk show host who always tells people he told people about stuff five years ago and now it's come to pass. But eight years ago, I said that iTunes was not going to be sustainable because they had it doing music and they had it doing video and they had it uh, TV and movies and all sorts of other stuff. That eventually this would be the camel where you put the last straw in the back and it collapses. Well, they finally decided that they were going to start splitting it up. So iTunes, the program, is going to go away. Now, for some of you, you're not into music, you're not in, you, you don't really care about iTunes because you don't use it. Well, actually you do because iTunes was the conduit that we could move data from our Macintosh computers on for our mobile devices, older legacy mobile devices, through a cable. So you plug your iPhone into a cable, you plug it into your Mac notebook or iMac, and then iTunes would come up and say, oh, you want to refresh your contacts, you want to make a backup, etc." Well, iTunes isn't going to be there anymore. And they weren't real clear about how your backups are going to occur to uh, desktop machine. So I suspect they're going to be trying to channel everything through iCloud from now on. Bill, yes. uh, you're going to be syncing through the Finder now. Syncing through the Finder. It'll show up in a Finder window. Okay. okay. Um, that'll be interesting to see how they how they implement that. There's no Finder on your phone. So basically, you know, they inside when you open a window and you have all the devices on the list. Yeah. And then later, your device and then you'll, you'll do a well. They right click on your when you phone. select the iPhone, then there's going to be a window pop up, and it's going to look like iTunes did. Okay, okay, because okay. you know you may you may have twigged after a, a few sessions with me that I tend to have older legacy devices that I still use, and uh, you know anything that reflects how useful they are, you know, that's important to me. Maybe not to you. Yes, George. Uh, so I can't afford an i, i uh, a Mac Pro. I'm, is there some uh, other desktop Macs that you know are still available? What are okay. Hi. The first thing to remember is that this Mac Pro is really aimed at a specific user. Yeah. The people that are doing digital film in 5K. And they're editing, you know, so like the people are making commercial movies. Right. Okay. It's not aimed at the people that are making YouTube videos. And it's not aimed at the people who read their emails, surf the web, once in a while print a document. Okay. So for you, the Mac Mini, the iMac, these 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 devices have more power than the average user is ever going to fully use. I mean, hardware-wise, are, are, are we going to be getting some new hardware? You know, if I need to replace my iMac, what do I get? Just a reminder that they upgraded the processors in the regular iMacs this year. They upgraded the processors in the iMac Pro last year, and they're scheduled to do it again after the first of the year. And the Mac Minis, they they. They, they brought those up also. So they are moving ahead. It'll be interesting to see where they go from here. Because right now they're using all Intel processors. All right, so how many of you have heard about the Ryzen chips from AMD? Yeah, OK. I always can count on you. You know more than I do. OK, anyway, the Ryzen chips from AMD very, very popular because 
graphic cards for PCs got so insanely expensive because of a thing called cryptocurrency, where you're doing bit mining to, and you need video cards to do that. So people are sucking the supply of video cards. Well, with the Ryzen processors from AMD, they have the video stuff and the CPUs all in one chip in a really efficient, bodacious package. And they've been eating up Intel's market share like you wouldn't believe. OK, so what happens in the future? If Intel isn't able to meet the needs of Apple for increasingly faster, more efficient chips, with more CPU cores and more CUDA cores, what will Apple do? Well, will they go to the ARM chips that are used in the iPads and the phones and the iPods? And Apple owns that chip maker. Or will they go AMD for some of their devices? So this is, nobody knows where, where they're going to go yet. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. Because that will mean a dramatic shift of what the software has to interact with. And if AMD ends up with it, with, with the, taking that market share, they're going to be the leaders, and we're going to see something that's a non-Intel chip in the future. So, and then you got quantum computing coming down the line. But there's all sorts of stuff. Yes? Did NVIDIA ever provide chips for Apple? Yes. NVIDIA provided, uh, in the early days, uh, custom chips for the main boards in Apple computers. And there was that period towards the end of the power PC max where you didn't know if you were going to have an ATI uh, graphics board in it or a Radeon from uh, from NVIDIA. You know. um, the Radeon, just, the Radeon it, is also AMD. Hmm? The Radeon is also AMD. Oh, okay. Well, it's it's whatever the NVIDIA yeah, is. <laughs> uh, NVIDIA just lost a major contract with Dell. Dell's going to be putting AMD video boards in their high end machines. And they've already started to start shipping desktop machines with AMD Ryzen processors. Okay. Um, there's another thing that AMD did that I think was very smart. Okay. If you've ever tried to figure out what kind of RAM you can put in a PC, you end up with all these different motherboard designations and all sorts of different socket designations for the CPU, and then there's all these different variations of Intel CPUs. You need like a, a glossary of index to be able to figure out what works with what. <coughs> AMD has Ryzen 3, Ryzen 5, and Ryzen 9. And by knowing the number, you can tell what family it is, and you know exactly what main boards will work with it what RAM will work with it. So they made it really simpler for the people that build their own machines or who have a machine and they want to upgrade. Uh, so anything you do to make it easier for the customer to buy your product versus someone else, guess what happens? Customers like easy. That was one of the things that I always thought helped drive Mac market share in the early days. Um, with Microsoft, it was like, okay, after Windows 98 Second Edition, you have all these different flavors of their operating system, and you never knew which one to buy. And even today, Windows 10 comes in about 13, uh, about 12 different flavors. And you sort of go like, okay, which one should I get? Where Apple was always pretty much, yeah, here we are. This is, this is the operating system right now. In 18 months, we'll come out with a newer one, and most of the machines will continue to work on it. They made it simple for you to figure out what was going on. Almost to the point now where I really wonder if Microsoft will eventually go to just having a free Windows 10 operating system, the same model that Apple's using. But remember, free isn't free. So it's going to be interesting over the next two to three years, yes. if we get into the 2020s, it's going to be interesting to see how they, they, uh, they proceed, especially since you're going to have a new class of computing device 
uh, which will be not the wearable, but the embeddable. You're, you're already seeing it. Well, okay, many pacemakers are computer controlled. Well, now they have pacemakers that can talk to your iPhone. So if you're having what you think are palpitations, you don't have to go into the doctor. You just take your iPhone, have his, your iPhone talk to his iPhone. There's an app, and he can like do a you know, thing, tell what's going on. Uh, there's also uh, embedded computers for doing dosages of things such as insulin, pain medication, etc. Uh, but there's another whole class that are starting to show up in the military that have not gone into the commercial market yet, where it's computing power, it's embedded, um, it, and it's powered by the bot. Okay. So anyway, so just you know, things that are coming down the pipe. All right. So anyway, let's see if we can get back on track. All right. So we did news. Basically, go to the Apple website, and they've got the keynotes, and you can, if you're interested in the watches, what's going on with the watches, what's going on with the phones, they've got all the, the stuff up there. Uh, freebies wanted and for sale. Anybody bring anything in there selling today? Surprise. It's a <laughs> yeah, well, basically, we have the, uh, the new hotness and the, uh, the old hotness in the uh, iPad Pro that I'm selling. Uh, so it comes with this nice nifty uh, book book case and the uh, first gen Apple Pencil. And uh, anything, I'll entertain any offers over 450 bucks. So. And then I've still got a uh, first gen uh, watch and other items, so talk to me at the break. Okay, so we see Dan at the break and see what he brought in this month. All right, everybody else, everybody looking for stuff? Or once going twice? All right, and uh, this is where I normally do my service announcement, my PSA, about if you have old devices, old computers sitting in the closet, they're not being used, you can't just take them and dumpster them. You can't just take them to your local Goodwill and drop them off because they have data on them. And a free service to the membership, we will decommission your older equipment for you and make sure that it goes to an appropriate place. Sometimes it gets recycled. Sometimes it gets refurbed and used by other people. Okay, But your data isn't with it. That's the important part. Okay, and Peter... Peter, just wait. Wait there, Peter. Peter gave me uh, some information about another place that looks like they're accepting uh, computers for recycling and that and refurbing. So I've got to check them out. But that gives me, you know, it's like I walk into a Goodwill and they go, Hi, Mr. Harris, what do you have for us today? <laughs> and I go, No, I'm just sitting here to, you know, buy a pair of fat pants. You know, I don't want eating too much. I need to. Cheap pair of pants. Okay. Hey, Bill. Yes. Your standard uh, public service announcements. Uh, you probably haven't read this yet. You got it also. This is from Shauna. You know, she is in the Red Cross. Mm -hmm. And she said that she got deployed. She got a call at 2.30 in the morning the day after, you know, mm -hmm. after that. And she's been working 12-hour shifts, you know, with the Red Cross with the tornado. Locally or did they? Yeah, locally here. She said she's been up in Trotwood. Yeah, they got hit. But fortunately, they have a very good mayor. That lady is amazing. Anyway. Yes? My laptop wanted an update, and so I did that. Mm -hmm. And then the whole machine froze, and it wouldn't start again. And so I took it to the Apple store, and they said, if we do anything, you'll lose data. Mm -hmm. But you might go to Gem City Digital, they'll Mm -hmm. might be able to save your data. Mm -hmm. I went to Jim's study and they said, no problem, everything's there, and they fixed it. Yeah. Okay. That's Jim's study where they have a little storefront in the green. Yeah. Right. They're like, um, if Von Moore's over there, they're like over this way. I so, can't yeah. do that. Okay. <laughs> anyway, Jim's city. They're great. They're, they're, great. they're up at the green. Yeah, where uh, they do Macintosh repairs uh, at the green. Yeah. 
And it is close to where Mac, whatever it is? No, think of the other, think of, uh, Mac Town used to be over on the east side. They're over towards the west side of the room. So right behind Panera. Yeah, they're yeah. near Panera. Oh, gotcha. There we go. Thank you. Gotcha. In the green. Yeah. In the green. In the green. In the green. And I think we have some cards over there, don't we, from Jim City? Mm -hmm. uh, on the freebie table. I think there's some card. Isn't there a card over there? I'm welcome. I'm welcome. I don't see it today. Okay. Oh, wait, 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 wait. That's this one. Let's see what yeah, that's yes, Gem City Digital, the green, 4457 Walnut Street. <laughs> Dayton, Ohio, 45440. What's that say? Digital.com. What's that say on the back? 10%? It says 10% off, not valid on the purchase of electronics. And they do repairs on smartphones, tablets, computers, and more. Uh, another outfit that does a lot of uh, very good work is DNA Computers. And they're located in Kettering. Um, and then there's another one, but I, it'll come back to me. So anyway, if you want to know about Gem City, we've got some discount cards up here from them. Okay, but the main thing is you got a good result. And they did it for nothing. Oh, what was even better? Oh, and and I thought when I went to the Apple store, everything was lost. I was just going to sit down and cry. Mm -hmm. And these guys fixed it. It was wonderful. Okay. And it was part of the hardware. And they just put just on the post it, unloaded it, and got it. They go. just pushed some buttons, and away all my problems went. Okay. Very good. That stresses um, the importance of backups, though. That yeah. kind of situation. Yeah. Um, but this points out an issue that Apple has had with their Apple stores. Um, when the, the guy that went over to, uh, anyway, the, the, the fellow who originally was doing the Apple stores, running them, uh, he, he was focusing on it as being a central point where you could come in and they would solve your problems. <coughs> Fast forward a couple years, then it became the place where it was your gathering place for the Apple community. That was their, their stated goal. Somehow, some way, it transmorphed into the place where they sell you stuff, and they don't want to fix your old stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and this varied, uh, depending on which Apple store you went to. If I stopped going to the green because it was always, this is the new stuff, no, that's too old, we don't touch it. Uh, where down in the Townsend Center in Cincinnati, that Apple store, they were still in that mindset of, oh, let's work with what you have, get it going, make sure you're, you're fully trained on it and that you're getting the most you can from your thing. And when it's time, we have newer, even neater stuff for you to purchase. Micro Center also. Yeah. Now, Micro Center on Mostella Road, they've always been focused on uh, doing the repair work, and they're, a vet, they're a still a value-added reseller, and it, they're Apple authorized. Where Gem City and DNA don't have Apple medallions. So they're working with uh, recycled, refurbished parts rather than Apple uh, repair parts. So, anyway, so those are three locations that, four locations that we can rely upon still today. Those are listed uh, on our webpage and the resources. Yeah, and there's a list on our webpage with resources of the various things. Uh, now, Apple's aware of this issue that they've got where the Apple stores really aren't doing what they were meant to do. And I think it was triggered because they noticed that certain Apple stores, the sales dropped off significantly. So maybe there was a little bit of a profit motive there. Uh, and they now have a new head of the Apple stores who's <coughs> supposedly fixing, the, focusing more on getting them back into meeting the needs of the customer. So we'll see where they, where they go after that. Okay, yes? Since we're on the pair cycles, um, my Mac Mini got flaky about a year ago. Okay. And uh, it started 
uh, acting like uh, it would take a power hit within its own self. And that was happening occasionally. And it got worse and worse and worse. And ultimately got so bad it couldn't even get up before it crashed again. And okay. that's crazy to drive and all that. Uh, <coughs> Apple didn't have anything to do with it. I think that would place Austin Landing. I can't remember what. Experiment. Experiment. Yeah. And they, they played around with it quite a bit and um, said, yeah, the motherboard's bad. Uh, no charge, so mm -hmm. you know, they seem to be good in that yeah. way, too. Experiment is no longer in business. Ah. Okay. Um, I had a similar issue. Was this like 2010, 2009, I mean, a Mac Mini? Probably around that. Yeah. Vintage. The graphic chips start to go bad. Huh. And you'll get a, it recycles, it'll yeah. power up, power yeah. up in for a little bit. Yeah. And then you get the confusing thing where if you have it run, it's diagnostics mm -hmm. that are built in. Mm -hmm. Everything checks out fine because it doesn't check graphics. Because it's doing the low res graphics because mm -hmm. it's yeah. universal. Yeah, and basically there is no fix for that. Uh, yeah. Well, actually, um, I found a place in New York City okay. that fixes motherboards. Okay. And they, so I sent it off to them, and uh, it was 150 plus, obviously, they shipping to them and mm -hmm. stuff, and it's alive again. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, did you have to strip out the board and just send that? So they would have set the whole thing? Set the whole <coughs> Now, I haven't had a lot of time to send play. Their, send me their, send me their, it's called Level 2 Computer. Send me an file. email with the, who they are, because I've got two of these bad girls just sitting there. Yeah, I, uh, you know, I looked at it. I like my machine. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, other world had used machines. So the war deal is only thirty days. So yeah. you know, I'm, I'm just as good rolling the dice on known hardware. I think it's interesting days. that I can buy a. 25 year old beige G3 power Mac from, I can't remember the name of the folks, they're down in Tennessee, and they give me a one year warranty on it. Yeah. <laughs> but if I'm buying something from OWC, it's 30 days. Yeah, that, that's a deal killer as far yeah. as I'm concerned. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I've had a similar experience with another company. Um, fixing a, a damaged screen on a classic iPod. And, um, you know, it came back for, I don't remember, some tens of bucks. And it's yeah. worked fine ever since, you know? So. Um, I've had iPods, iPhones. Uh, the, uh, the folks up at the green that we just mentioned, Digital City, uh, and DNA, and uh, the folks down in Mosteller, they all do those replacements. They also do battery replacements. Yeah, these people read it. Yes, Bill. Re battery replacements are kind of funny because unless your machine is obsolete, like on my 2012, it's still a vintage, mm -hmm. they can't just replace the battery. They have to replace it as a whole assembly and the keyboard and everything has to replace three or four hundred dollars. Yeah. Once this becomes obsolete, it's 100 bucks to fix the battery. Yeah. So be aware of that. Okay. <laughs> Any idea why? It's still under Apple's control. Oh, so they have to use Apple's supply. Okay. For example, I wanted to upgrade this to a one terabyte drive. Apple said they can only do what it came from the factory as yeah. to replace the drive. But. Uh, this was on another laptop of similar age. Uh, took it to uh, a micro center and they were able to replace the drive with no problem, upgrading the, the uh, capacity since it's obsolete. But if it's a vintage, you have to yeah. go by Apple's parameters as far as what you can replace. So that's where you, you get into this strange world of. Sometimes you get a better result not going to an Apple authorized repair service. Right. Yeah, they're, they're limited. Yeah. And if you're not an authorized repair service, but they do Apple work, you can get anything done. Yeah. 
Um, another thing to be aware of is that there's a movement among the IT community called Right to Repair. Okay. And it all started with international, excuse me, John Deere and International Harvester suing farmers who repaired their own farm equipment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what do you say? What? Yeah, okay. That's the right. Well, other companies have also started to do this. On your own Apple part. is one of them. <laughs> Apple has litigation against a repair shop in Norway because they were replacing screens <clears throat> with, on, on Apple equipment with refurbished Apple parts that didn't come from Apple. They're coming from a supplier probably in China. And so they've been, uh, they've lost the case twice and now they've resurrected it one more time to see if they, and if they succeed, I would suspect they'll start going after anybody who's doing repair work on Apple products that aren't Apple value-added resellers, value-added, yeah, Apple uh, repair offerings. Which to me is a really stupid thing for a company to do. You would think you'd want your customers to have those devices in working order, out in the public, showing the brand. Sort of like the, the rule that Rolls Royce had, that uh, when you had a Rolls Royce car that broke down on the road, they would immediately come get it, and there was a, they wouldn't tow it. There was a regular special kind of lorry that they would roll it into. So you never saw a Rolls Royce car being towed. <laughs> never. <laughs> All right, with that said, uh, let, yes, the one problem with their repair is it came back with the language set to, I don't know what that is. <laughs> Some pictogram, probably. Chinese or Taiwanese or something <laughs> language, and I had to I had to do a PMU reset for lack of being okay. able to uh, think, you know get the thing to stop. Was the serial number still there? Yeah, yeah, it was okay. the same. It was the same hardware because hmm. I put a few dots in different <coughs> places. I wonder stuff. where they sent it out to get. Uh, I I don't know. How long did Some, it take approximately? Weeks or so, I, I can dig back. Okay, okay long enough to ship it to Mom, Mumbai. And, uh, uh, I don't okay. think so. Okay. I don't think so. They 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 can do. I think they do. They fast turn around on these. Okay, we're in the best officially now. So <laughs> let me go back to John. All right, we'll go back to John after John finishes chatting with his neighbors. Who else had any help desk issues that we need to? Work on? Yes, Kathy Bean. I have a question. I have uh, Microsoft Office 11, and people are sending me documents now, and they, I can't, like, maybe they'll have red marks where they'd like changes, or they'll have a cross out, a word crossed out and another replaced, and I can't do that. Should I update, or is there some way around that? Okay. So the question becomes, what is the computer that you're running Office on, Microsoft Office on? It's a Macintosh iMac? It's a... It's the, the it iMac you follow? Oh, 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 this guy. Yeah, I forgot about that. I've forgotten his name. Uh, it's a MacBook Air. Mac Mac okay, Air. MacBook Air. And you know what operating system it's running right now? Click on the apple about. Oh, I don't yeah, do that. Yeah, it's a keyboard. So it's a keyboard. Like I get that. Yeah. Just in, in Kathy's defense, I get that all the time. My wife says, Bill, it's not an iMac. <laughs> or, sorry, it's an iMac. It's not an iPod. Use the keyboard. Use the mouse. I go, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I see it. Okay, is this what you wanted to know? Okay, so it's running Mac OS High Sierra. <laughs> and my response to you would be, if you really like Microsoft Office, and the people who are sending your stuff are using the newer version of Microsoft <coughs> Office, which is Microsoft Office 2016 or Microsoft Office 365, 
yeah, you should probably go ahead and buy the year subscription for the new stuff. Okay. Do I have to get it year by year, or can I just buy it once? You can <laughs> buy it once, but then it won't update when newer stuff comes out. It actually ends up, let's see, where's Rita? 2016. Rita, what did it end up for a year? It was like, I think I paid like $99 a year. Yeah, $99 a year. It, it, and, that's, and you can put it on up to five machines, any combination of Macs and PCs. And it, it ends up being that's less expensive. I think is the 2016 the latest uh, Mac for, I mean, uh, Microsoft yeah. Office for Mac? 2016? No. Correct. 2019. Uh, but there's a 2019 that's out there. Did it? And um, you don't have to and keep that, and if, you're doing, if you're doing Microsoft Office 365, and we're, we're diving down the rabbit hole, folks, because this is Microsoft, so they give you so many flavors and choices, you stand there not knowing what to select. If you're running Microsoft Office 365, it continuously updates. You may have something that's uh, closer to 2019 than 2016. I have 2016 Microsoft Office for Mac, and I don't pay Microsoft anything. I bought it. It's mine. Yeah. I use it year after year. So that's another way to go, to purchase Microsoft Office 2016. Now that costs about $250. 2019 just yeah. came out. Huh? <clears throat> I think for the personal use, uh, it's sixty-nine. Is it at the base? Ninety-nine, twenty, seventy dollars a month or a year, and you get the uh, you, you get the upgrades daily almost on that thing. I'm running. Uh, I got Windows 16 on my Mac. I didn't know if I needed to go down. Every time I log into Windows, and it says, "Well, it might slow down a little bit because we're yeah. four on the." Going to Kathy Toll. Kathy Beam's uh, comment about how she can't update. I know one thing new when I got the new um, the 365 Excel, they've got comments. Well, their comments can be um, turned off. No, they, they can have other people make comments. Okay? On the new one, it was called Note you have a new note in the cell. So only you can deal with that note. If you make a comment <coughs> and you send it to somebody else, they can add to the comments because it's it's linked somehow. I don't know, but that, that's one of the things that, the only thing that I've noticed that's really different is the note versus the comment. Okay. This is William good? stepping under the soapbox. There's this whole new way of doing work called collaboration, yeah. okay, which is going to do for productivity in the office the same thing that multitasking did. Okay. Um, collaboration is appropriate, but you should get your own <coughs> draft done first before people start. Oh, you should do this, change that. Oh, it should be the gun, not a. No. Rough draft, complete, then you send it out for comments. I find that, that using an email process is much more productive than the constant, the, the, the document is available to everyone at all times and they can be throwing stuff on it. It's like too many cooks in the kitchen. Hey, Bill. Yes. Uh, doesn't Pages open Word documents? Yes, it does. So why, why doesn't she just use Pages? Because Kathy and I have had this discussion, and Pages doesn't work the way her mind works. No, I, I use Pages, but when they send me a document from Word, it will have these strikes out that my Pages don't deal with. Oh, I thought she was talking about well, that's because they've got track changes turned on. So what you're seeing is all the stuff that they changed in addition to what you had before. Right. There's a way where you can say, do not show me changes. In Pages? In Pages and in Office 2011. But it gets so convoluted having to find it every time that it's usually not worth the effort. Just simpler to go with the newer version of the software that has it turned off by default. In pages. 
No, no, in the new Microsoft yeah, Office. I'm, I'm not sure I want to do that, but yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Homework assignment. <laughs> yes. Oh, come on, you're back from a cruise. I know. You're all rested. <laughs> What's okay. my? Your homework assignment is to take one of those things that you've gotten that's a Microsoft Word document yeah. where it's got all these underlines and cross throughs. Open it in pages and see if it shows you those things or not. And let me know. <clears throat> Delegation. <clears throat> yes, Karen. Um, is there an extension that tells you how much memory is being done and, and uh, like a speedometer or it shows you yeah. what all is happening in your There's phone? a whole bunch of them that will do that. Okay. Um, are we talking about on the phone? Or no. no I'm in. Yeah. Um, there's a activity, yeah. activity monitor. <laughs> There's an app that I use to monitor how much free memory there is yeah. uh -huh. uh, on my iMac when I'm when I'm got a, you know I'm doing all sorts of stuff all at once, which I shouldn't do, but I do. Anyway, and that program is called. Let's see if I've got it on this one. Okay, I don't have it on this machine, but I'm going to go the activity to the app store, bring it up, and it's called memory something. And we'll just go over to updates. Memory cleaner? We'll click here. <laughs> I have an iStat program. Yeah, except that iStat works in, okay, it's called memory clean. Memory clean. Um, the trial version very nicely shows you how much is being used and how it's being used. Um, the paid version allows you to uh, clear out unused memory and free it up for use again. Um, let, let me restate this way. Think of, think of the memory in your iMac as a kid's playground. <clears throat> okay? And you got people throwing frisbees across the playground, and you got people playing marbles. I don't know if people can still do that. Anyway, jump and roll, um, and you got people uh, that are just hanging out. Well, space gets used up that really isn't being used. You know, you've got the path of that frisbee going over, so people can't use that. So, what a program like Memory Clean does is it says, okay, there's all this memory being used, but some of it really isn't being used, so let's take, collect all the memory that these various programs think they're using and free it up so it's available to other programs. And that's what memory clean does. But, but, but did you, did you do an activity report, so to speak? Yeah. Uh, here, let me do this just real quick. Puts a little colored dial on the upper part and it'll show you which programs are using the most memory. Oh. You can hit the middle button and that will optimize it. Yeah. So you can actually see it oh, I see. freeing up memory. If you want here, what I'll do is I'll go ahead and tell it to put it on my uh, my computer. And Pat, do you, later do you, on we'll, we'll take a look. Do you turn off your computer when you're done or do you, you put it to sleep? In your in your finder under your beg your pardon. Do you just put your computer to sleep or do you actually turn it off? In there? Mm -hmm. I mean, something when you're done thing. using the computer. Yeah, I just uh, turn it off. You turn it off? There's an activity manager app, but it doesn't really let you free up memory. Oh, okay. It'll just tell you what's going on, okay. but it won't let you. Well, that, was, that was the original you know, question. Tell me how much memory I have to left. Just look at the activity monitor. Mm -hmm. To be bold. Take action. Well, it, <laughs> it, okay. it does show you what, what, who's using what, and then it shows you how much different yeah. programs are using, and it yeah. more specifically it tells you which oh, ones are hogging memory. Almost all of these will be your web browsers. Yeah. Uh, yes. Okay. And it has to do with uh, the way that web browsers are developed now. They are not parsimonious with 
using the memory. Okay, I'm going to say last call for a help desk. Yep. Is there anybody yep. else? We'll go to help. Okay, uh, I just bought a new uh, uh, I, uh, iPad mini and uh, got it in an old case, but uh, when I started to look up my uh, files under uh, Word, mm -hmm. because I keep TMG file uh, yeah. notes on, on in here on Word, uh, I can't find it. I, you know, I go to recent, which should show all my old recent, and there's nothing there. Uh, is okay, it are you saving your Microsoft <coughs> documents in, micro, in Microsoft's cloud, because they're not going to be immediately available to that unless they're in a cloud form. Microsoft's cloud? Yes. It doesn't go to my iCloud no. account? because Microsoft programs don't put stuff into Apple's iCloud. Oh, they I put know. it into their own cloud. I think I probably do have a Microsoft cloud <clears throat> account somewhere. Yeah. I have to go to that. So this is this is where we talk about ecologies, IT ecologies. So if I see someone is using Google Calendar and Gmail, and they want to have their stuff on other machines, I have them use Google Drive and all that Google stuff to synchronize their data. Yeah. If they're uh, a Windows person and they're using Microsoft Windows 10 and Windows 8.1 and Windows 8 and they're using Office and they and they want to be able to synchronize this stuff, then I have them set up their Microsoft Cloud account. I'm trying to remember what the, uh, it used to be called SkyDrive and now it's called something else. Uh, OneDrive? Something like that. Anyway, and that's where your stuff gets stored in the cloud. Yeah. And of course, Apple, it would be iCloud. So uh, Amazon apps would be in the Amazon cloud. So, so, so if I go to that account, I, I keep all my passwords and usernames on about 10 pages of, of, uh, of a Word document that's uh, uh, encrypted. So I don't have okay. to remember all that stuff. Okay. So I can go on there and I can find my old Microsoft account. And if I log in, I should be able to find those documents. <coughs> yeah, if, if you have them, we're saving them to the Microsoft Cloud. Okay. I know that when I was typing them, it, does, it was automatic save. I didn't have to hit a save button. That is correct, can. but where is it saved? Chances are it's saving to the local machine, not to the cloud. Can you drive. save the, those documents on an iPad? Uh, iPad? The, you can set up your files program on your iPad to also look at Dropbox, Apple iCloud, Google Drive, and the one that Microsoft uses. But it won't save it on here. It doesn't use that. No, precious but memory. it lets you bring it in as you need it. I got you. Okay. okay. Thanks. One more question. All right. Uh, now, you can use Clean My Mac to clean up your computer, get things straight. Yeah. If there's, but you want to be, you want to, you don't want to be doing that every day. Oh no, you do it like once a month, you yeah. know, whenever. Okay. After you buy that. Yeah. There's but, a good advice that you used to give on regularly when you're working with graphics or photographs or documents. Save regularly. Yep. Anytime you get up for a break, you save. Yep. If you need, if you today we're having problems with dynamic RAM and other kinds yep. of things. Well, the corollary to that is you just reboot when you take a break. It clears up a, a, a lot of unused memory. It clears up the RAM. Yes. Let me put it this way: When I finish working on the family I make, and my wife's going to be me in her account, and she's going to be playing a bridge game. I restart the computer as I get up so that she has a fresh, if you will, calendar to work upon. And, and that takes care of this apparently running out of space, the computer slowing down as you're working on projects. That is correct, but sometimes we have things that we have to run at the same time right. and we can't do the reboot because we're in the middle of rendering a video. 
you know, it, it's a 20, 12 hour process and you don't want to start it over again. That's when you use one of these programs to free up memory. Okay. Well, going back to the clean my Mac thing, yep. is there a built in alternative or another thing that does that, that kind of work? The reason I'm asking is now when I open up Safari, it will not open up and something else. And so I always have to force quit it and the second time mm -hmm. it will open. And that's happened repeatedly. I mean, it'll just stay there, you know, four minutes. And it's always those two programs. And I didn't, I've used Clean My Mac, you know, when yeah. you were there. But we but didn't I, look at your permissions and the other things that can cause problems. Okay. <clears throat> if my memory serves correct, one of the things you told me was that your photos program would only work if the photos library was yes. on your desktop. Correct. What mm -hmm. that says to me is that the mother may eyes, they're actually called Unix permissions, mm -hmm. are not set properly on your machine. It's not letting you have access to things that it should let you have access to. Okay. 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 So you just kind of live with it. Yeah. I mean, no. the second time I can, no. I can get it to work. I know where you live now. Well, I mean, that, that's just a small thing. Yeah, yeah. It's a small thing, but extremely irritating and aggravating. Well, yeah. And both you and I are at the stage of life where we don't need irritation and aggravation because we're not paying us to be irritated and aggravated. <laughs> so um, there's some things you could do and I'll, I'll send you a, a, a homework assignment that uh, okay. Clean My Mac should be able to do for you. Okay. Okay. That I hope will solve the problem. Okay. Okay. What are we doing for the time? Okay. We'll do it. Which one am I doing, John or? Well, you can take care of my problem privately unless other okay. people. Did have you get a new batch of wine in to sample? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we, we can't do it now, John. We'll have to do it over lunch one day. Okay. Uh, just a, a follow, follow up on the, the new operating system coming out, the full yes. Catalina. Yes. Okay, that's going to be a 64 bit system, as I understand it. It's not going to run any 32 bit apps anymore. Correct. So um, if you're dependent upon an app which is 32 bit, and as far as you can tell, the developer, is not going to update it to 64-bit. Mm -hmm. What options do we have in the future to continue to use those apps and still upgrade to the latest operating system? So glad you asked because that brings mm -hmm. us to the wonderful world of computer emulation where we can run what appears to be to the computer, to your eyes, a 1994 Macintosh Power PC running all sorts of wonderful stuff in Mac OS 9, or an uh, older version of an operating system for, for Mac, a Unix based, you know, like something like a Snow Leopard in a virtual machine where the rules of that universe only hold in that universe. So you can have your 32 bit apps and your Power PC apps running inside that virtual machine on a computer that's running Catalina or Mojave or High Sierra. The wonderful world of computer emulation. Or you boot off an external and hard drive. Or, 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 or you boot off an external <laughs> hard drive that you've installed in the yeah. operating system on. Which is so, a, which is a those are the kind of, of emulation. Those are the kind of options, pros and cons, that I'd like to see explored between now and, and when the new operating system actually hits Okay. It's our computers and yeah. Are you willing to put some effort into the game with me? Because we'll, what, what I'll do is you and I will have a conversation and we'll try various things and see which ones are least irritating and aggravating. Well, I may not be equipped right now to try some of those variations based on what hardware is available to me and things like that. Yeah. So. Yeah, but it just, just, you know, I need a guinea pig. I'll do the hard lifting and say, okay, here, Richard, try, try launching this thing and see how it works. As long as it doesn't put my system at risk, I'm <laughs> sure, but why not? Oh, yeah. In the presentation, we'll talk about Even it. Oh, we'll the, the software I use to maintain our web page is only 32 bit. We need to connect later on in the week.
Kathy. I just want to make a comment I'm, to remind people that I'm redoing the directory, and if anybody here wants to get the picture taken, I brought my camera. Okay. So at the break, She's the or after the meeting, if you don't want us to use that old photo, the passport photos that we got from the FBI, or the driver's license photos, <laughs> you might want to see this folder so she can take a fresh new <coughs> appealing photograph of you for the director. Okay. okay, so going once, going twice, we're on break. <coughs> Okay, we're ready to go. Set for help. Beginner's Guide to Classic Mag Emulation. And your presenter is William Herrick. And if you got devices, that make noise, please turn them off. Behold, behold the classic Macintosh. Motorola 68000 processor, later on followed up by the 68020, 030, and 040 processor. And later on, with the power PC chips. So what are we going to cover? What is emulation? The advantages of emulation. Classic Mac emulator selection. we got three main choices now. Mini VMAC, Basilisk, and Sheep Shaver, which I'm just going to call SS from now on. Because there's no way you can say Sheep Shaver consistently through without, without getting in trouble. <laughs> okay. Web emulation resources, web software resources, and a sheet shaver demo, SS demo. Moving right along. Okay, any questions at this point? No, moving right along. What is emulation? What's a sheep shaver? Oh, wow, that's the same. Virtualization oh, wait, is not wait, emulation. Previously, we have shown you how to run a Windows operating system or a Linux operating system in Parallels Desktop for the Mac, VirtualBox, uh, Fusion. There's a bunch of programs that let you do that. You virtualize machines when they're going to be using the same processor that's in the host computer. So if I've got a Macintosh and it's got an Intel processor and I want to run Windows 7 on it, and I know Windows 7 uses an Intel processor, then I can just use a virtualization program to get me where I want to go. Because the host computer and the virtual computer both would be using the same kind of CPU. Now, if I want to run Commodore 64 software on my Macintosh, or CPM on my Macintosh, or Apple II software on my Macintosh, or early classic Mac stuff on my Macintosh, they use CPUs that are not Intel CPUs, modern Intel CPUs. So I have to use a program that's emulating the central processing unit and whatever proprietary ROMs that operating system, that computer had, and then you install the appropriate operating system and then your software. So it's an extra step to go. So emulation recreates an original computer environment with the help of software and hardware. The process of creating an authentic emulator, it is complex and it is time consuming. But once they've got that program running right, then you're good to go. And it provides the authenticity of the original computer environment, digital object, without the need for the original computer system. Okay. So, what does this mean? Advantages. <clears throat> One computer can be many different machines. All right. For those few who have been in my basement and seen the warehouse of old computers, you have also heard my wife say to me, you know, it's past time to clean up. How many Timex Sinclair ZXs do you need? How many Apple II Cs do you need? How many, you know, time to clean up? Well, <clears throat> with emulation, 
I can still run my Nibble software for my Apple II on my modern Macintosh. Or I can run my early Macintosh games on my modern Macintosh. One computer that can run all this stuff. Okay, so that's a big advantage. You can clear out the clutter and get rid of those old machines. Your host computer has full internet access. That's really important because if I'm trying to do stuff on an old computer, the actual hardware, I'm on an Apple II, and I need some utility to do something, I'm not connecting to the internet with that machine very easily. There are ways to do it, but let me tell you, it is painfully slow connectivity. Okay. So having your host computer be able to access the internet and pull stuff in, from your network, even if it's documents, that's a big plus. The other thing is, modern equipment is more reliable than computers that are several decades old. Every time I fire up my Apple II Platinum, I hope that the magic smoke will not get released. That's when your capacitors and your power supply go through. And you get this little toxic plume of smoke because that means that I then have to find capacitors for that power supply. I've got to desolder them. I've got to solder them. This is more than a couple days project. Well, but if I'm doing emulation, I'm using my modern equipment to run all that software and those operating systems. So I don't need the old hardware. I can let it sit there and look pretty in the display case. And last but not least, you can swiftly switch between different combination permutations of CPUs, operating systems, and software. So, if I've got a couple different emulators on my Mac running Mojave, and I want to run Apple II GS software, I launch Sweet 16, point it at the disk images, and I'm now running the Apple II GS with all its software on my modern machine. And then if I decide, hey, I don't want to, I don't want to do that anymore. I want to be running uh, Choplift. The Choplifter? Anyway, it was this early Mac game where you had this horse cart going along, and you're dropping a guy from a chopper. I think it was the Choplifter. Yeah. If I want to play that, well, I just fire up my Mac emulator, launch it, start playing it, and when I get tired of that, I can go do whatever else I want. All right, so you can quickly switch between these once you've got them set up. Okay, so let's talk about selection of an emulator. And we're going to specifically be talking about if you want to emulate classic Macintoshes. That would be the early Mac 128s up to the Mac 2s, and then the whole quadra line and the LCs and the LC3s, all those guys, and then later on the Power Macs. So, uh, to put it in more uh, simple terms, anything from Apple Mac OS 4 up to Mac OS 9. That's the range of software that we're going to look at today. <coughs> so, for best results, you should select an emulator for the computer CPU and operating system on which your software has to run. So, if I've got an Amiga game from 1970s, I'm going to find an emulator for Amiga that can run the Amiga OS, their operating system, and that I can load the software onto. If I want to be playing Commodore 64 stuff, I'm going to find a Commodore 64 emulator. If I want to do a Mac Plus, I'm going to find an emulator for the Mac Plus and the software it brings. If I want to do something that's in the middle range, the 60, you know, System 6, 7, or 8, there's another one to do that. And if I want to do 7, 8, 8, 1, 8, 5, 8, 6, and Mac OS 9, there's another one for that. So you, you pick your emulator on what kind of machine it can emulate. Another thing to keep in mind is that with these emulators, typically any host system can run the emulator. In other words, they've got a version for Macintosh OS X, they got a version for Linux, and they got a version for Windows. Hmm. So I can be on a Windows 10 machine 
running an emulator for an Apple II GS. Okay. Or I could be on a Linux machine with an emulator for Mac OS 8.5. Okay. So. We've got, we've got freedom. We, you know, whatever we got around, we can use. So that means that users of Mac OS, X, Windows, Linux, and even more esoteric operating systems can all enjoy classic Mac software. Okay? So, today, in 2019, the popular classic Mac emulators are, so take all the stuff up out of Amiga and Commodore, Atari, just sort of throw, put that to the side. We're just doing early Mac. Our Mini V Mac, Basilisk 2, and Sheep Shaver, which I will now refer to from now on as SS. Okay, Mini V Mac. It's an open source emulator of Motorola 68,000 based Macintosh computers. So we're talking. Um, Mac 128 up to the Mac Classic model. So that's your Mac Plus, 512, 512 KE, SEs, and your classic Mac Classic models. And it comes in a Windows, Mac OS X, and Linux version. Second choice is Basilisk 2. And it's also an open source emulator of the Motorola chip, but notice we're now talking 68XX. Ah, that means the 020 processors, 030, 040, so that would be your Mac 2s, your Mac 2 CXs, and then later on your LC3s and your Quadras, that stuff. With Basilisk 2, you can boot Mac OS version 7X, so that'd be like 70, 71, 75 up to Mac OS 8.1, okay? And ports of Basilisk 2 are available for Mac OS X, Windows, and Linux. When they say a port, that means they've taken the program and they've made a version for that other operating system. So that's what they mean when they say port here. Uh, it requires a Macintosh ROM image and a copy of Mac OS to be installed. Those you have to supply yourself. The reason why is, that's right, David Gray, copyright. This is copyrighted proprietary material that belongs to Apple, and they don't want you to pirate it. If you own a classic Macintosh, Part of owning it means that you have the right to use the material that's on its ROM, and there are utilities that will let you make a copy of the ROM. And I'm not going to go into that. We're just going to show you that what you can do once the system is fully configured. If you're interested in emulating stuff, maybe we'll run a workshop in the summer, or you can just tell me and I'll show you real quick how to set it up without violating any laws. Last but not least, SS, an open source emulator of the Apple PowerPC Macintosh. This is the sweet spot because typically you can run the early stuff that ran on the Mac Plus and the Mac 2 on a Power Macintosh because it's got special secret sauce in there, Rosetta, that lets you run the older stuff. So, SS, along with the appropriate ROM image, is possible to emulate a PowerPC Macintosh computer capable of running Mac OS 7522904. And builds of SS are available for Windows machines, Linux machines, and Mac OS machines. Okay. Now, web resources. If you're interested in doing this, or you think you're interested, you want to pay attention to these. <coughs> the website, immaculation.com. Okay. <laughs> this is the mothership that you go to if you want to emulate a Macintosh computer. They have how-to guides for all the different emulators 
And I'm talking about not just verbiage, but screenshots. This is what it should look like in the preferences, and this is what it should look like. And they walk through where you can get software for the older machines, legally through the internet, and how you can access uh, uh, other things that you need to. So, excellent how-to guide to get legacy software to run in your emulator legally. Okay. So, the first one is MacintoshGarden.org. This is an abandonware site. So, there's software that is no longer being sold. Yes? Could you turn the game down a little bit? You're distorting. Sure. How's that? Better? Yeah, just say, say something loudly. Well, and I should say something loudly. Better? And worse? How's that? Better? I okay. Guess. I'm sorry. I get excited when I do this kind of stuff. This is where my true geekiness comes out. Anyway, Abandonware, it was commercial software. It's no longer being sold, and the people who developed it have released it into the public domain, or at least are not going to enforce their copyright anymore. There are several thousand programs available for this, and it's the installers that they would have shipped. Okay. So a lot of shareware's up there from way back when. Really good site. And it's not just games, though there are tons and tons of games. It's also utilities that we used to use for our address books, printing stuff, and finding old copies of various utilities. It's a wonderful, wonderful site. They also have a, a good selection of how-to guides. And the thing that I like the most is when you go to a, uh, in the web page, you go to a particular piece of software, they will tell you whether it works with this emulator or this emulator best. So I was looking for, ah, this is the version that you want to download. It works really well with SS. That saves a lot of time and effort. The next one is MacGUI.com. This is sort of a potpourri of all sorts of old legacy stuff. They got pictures, uh, people using computers, they've got software, they have uh, photos, downloads, information, manuals, all sorts of stuff. And it's Apple II and Mac stuff. So if you have a, uh, I'm trying to think, uh, I'm trying to remember my Apple II uh, processor cards. If you've got a Atlanta Scientific uh, card for an Apple II that you can use to measure different temperature probes, and you want to find the manual and the software that lets you program it, that's probably your best bet. And then last but not least, archive.org. This is the Internet Archive. The Internet Archive, quotes, capitals, underlined. This is the archive. Think of it as like the Smithsonian attic for the Internet. Now they have on the Internet Archive software library, and there's specifically one for the Macintosh. And up there you can either run the software from their website, or you can download and install it in your own emulator. So again, a huge source of stuff that's out there. Also, if you need to go back and find an old version of a web page, yes. that's the place. They have a thing called the Wayback Machine. Oh, yeah. The Wayback Machine, uh, you can say, show me what the Kodak photography website looked like on June 3rd of 1986. And sometimes you're not able just to look at it, but you can download things that they had that were available, like drivers for photo scanners and that kind of stuff. So, uh, and this was all before uh, websites had their robot.txt files and everything. You know, to keep it. Any questions at this point? Yes. So a lot of the software, especially games, ran off of the three and a half inch floppy drive. Mm -hmm. how, do, how do you get around, I mean, is there, you have to have that actual piece of hardware, or is there some way 
to when you download the software from these websites, it's in a .dsk format, which is a virtual disk image. I can open that in my emulators. So it's like I have put a floppy disk in, and I open it up, and there I've got uh, you know a couple different games that I had on that floppy disk. But if you actually have the old version of something that's on floppy drives, I mean, do they do they still make three and a half inch floppy drives? They still make three and a half inch floppy drives that are USB cables. They still make five and a quarter floppy drives with USB cables. They still make eight inch floppy drives. But those have typically a FireWire connector on them. I don't know why, but they do. Um, it's much easier to just go to something like Macintosh Garden, look for the software, see if it's there, and if it is there, to bring it in already in a package emulator format. Okay. But yeah, you can do it. But then you've got like a two or three step process to get that stuff well, if you wanted to get more data into an old <coughs> spreadsheet or something. Ah, now, data's different. Mm -hmm. Data's different. And when I do the, sheet, uh, the SS demo, I'll show you how you put things into the emulator. Okay. Any other questions at this point? Go to once or twice. Okay, cool. Then we're going to turn on the Wayback Machine. Okay. Mr. Sherman, uh, Mr. Peabody and his boy Sherman. Those of you who get it, some people don't. We're going to go back to 1994. And we're going to be doing stuff in a Power Mac G4. So let me just real quick before I, before I fire this stuff up, let me just show you two folders here. OK. And I'm going to just zoom in here a little. Good. Okay, so this first folder is inside my applications folder, and it's got the SS program, and it has a thing called a let me get this. Let me just make them big. That big. Okay, so what have I got here? This right here is the program. That's the emulation program. This file is a Macintosh ROM. It came out of a particular Power Mac computer. Over here, I have a virtual disk that has an image of Mac OS 9 in it. Over here, I've got a different way of saving an operating system, which has got Mac OS 7 in it. And over here, I've got another one that's a Mac OS 9 image. Over here, I've got a folder that's called Unix. That folder is inside my shared folder on my Mac. Okay. So that Unix folder is how I put stuff into the emulator because it's a network share as far as the emulator operating system is concerned. And you'll notice that it's got a folder called desktop. Well, I put something into this folder and if I drag it into that desktop folder, it shows up on the desktop of the emulation computer. Okay, so enough of this stuff. Let's fire up Sheet Saver. So you'll notice <laughs> that we've got a Mac OS 9 startup screen, and now we're getting our parade of icons down at the bottom. And boop! Okay, we're in Mac OS 9 at this point. Now, I have it running in a window. I can run it full screen. So what I'm going to do is just very quickly go to my preferences.
for the program, and I'm going to say, hey, I want to run it full screen, and I'm going to say save and quit. I'm going to shut down my Mac OS 9 machine, and when I start it up again, it's going to be full screen. Make it a little bit easier for you guys to see it, guys and gals. Okay, so just to be clear, I've got a modern 2016-2017 MacBook Pro running OS X, excuse me, Mac OS Mojave. And I'm running software from 1994 on it. So I just went back 25 years. I'm running Mac OS 9 on a Mojave system. Now what if we only have an, an older but modern system? Give me an example. Hi, what, High Sierra or... You know, okay, oh, that's, see, High Sierra, you don't want to do emulation because it can use the same chip that you currently have in your computer. You would virtualize that. You'd be running it in Parallels, um, Parallels Desktop for the Mac or a VirtualBox, one of those programs. Here, we've got to do some extra secret sauce to get it to run. Because we've got to emulate a Motorola PowerPC central processing unit and the special proprietary RAM and the audio chips that were on that motherboard, to the main board. Motherboard boards are no longer allowed. That's PC verboten. Just like you can't have master and slave hard drives anymore. Um, so th this is, to me, sort of miraculous that we're able to do this. Now, just to show you what we actually have going here, I'm going to go to my Apple in Mac OS 9, and I'm going to go to Apple System Profiler, and it's telling me that it thinks it's running Mac OS System 9.04, and it thinks it's running on a 100 megahertz PowerPC G4, and it thinks it's specifically on a Power Macintosh 9500 series. And it thinks it's got one gigabyte of built-in memory. Ooh. Ooh. Okay. And if we click over here on devices and volumes, it's got two hard drives. It's got a thing called Unix, which is really, really big. And then it's got this thing called SS Mac OS 9 hard drive, which is 511 megs in size. And it's 96%. Okay, so let's go to file and let's say quit. <coughs> All right, so what can we be running in this? Well, how about AppleWorks? Remember AppleWorks? Love it. How about MacWrite Pro? <laughs> now, you can connect to the internet. Let me just click. Okay. But you're going to have to use a special web browser to do it, and it's going to be incredibly slow. The web browser you would use is called Quasilla. You know, it's a, a play on the word Mozilla, because they're taking Firefox and they're changing it around. I'm not going to try and launch that because it is incredibly painful when you do that. Can you print a document? To modern day Hold on a second. I just accidentally shut down my computer, Whoa. so let me bring her back up. That was user error because I'm used to going to uh, the special menu to say, okay. uh, what do you want to bring up? Uh, can you actually print out documents? <laughs> you can print from this. With the, with the existing printer? There's a little bit of magic that has to happen. You have to go into your control panels, uh, your Mac OS 9 control panels, and then you have to go into, i got to think for a second. Uh, ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum. Um, anyway, there, there's a way that you can configure printers to it. Software update. Normally what I do is I just take that, that <laughs> function. You, you can do it. I'll just say that. Um, if you, you're better off if you're 
trying to print to a USB printer that's directly connected as opposed to a network printer. But yes, you can do it. Uh, let me give you another advantage uh, example here real quick. Let's say we want to install a program. Okay, I just did a switch from Mac OS 9 is still running over in one screen, and I'm back in Mojave. Let's say I want to install ooh, antivirus protection. I want disinfectant from John Nordstrom, Northwestern University, and I want it in my Mac OS 9. So I can check all those uh, files that I'm bringing in. So let me go to Downloads here. Now, I'm in Downloads in Mojave. And, okay, here we go. Here's the program Disinfectant. And I'm going to drag, hello, come on. And, why don't you do that? I'm going to move the Yeah, yeah. Move it to the trash and see if it'll let me move it out of the trash. There we go. There you go. <laughs> now, you're going to see some stuff. It's the, you know, little bumps in the road. That's operator error. I'm still learning how Mojave reacts to stuff. So, I put that disinfectant program inside the Unix folder. Now, when I go back to Mac OS 9, that Unix folder shows up as a hard drive called Unix. And I can drag my dis disinfectant out like that. So now I've got it in my Mac OS 9, and I can launch it. Hello, come on. Double click. Thank you. And we could uh, select what drive we want to scan. So let's scan our Mac OS 9 hard drive. And so there's disinfectant 371 from, I want to say, 1992, somewhere around in there, running inside Mac OS 9, inside SS on a Mac OS Mojave computer. Um, old games also work, other programs like Quicken Deluxe. Oh, let's see, I just launched Quicken Deluxe 98. And it says it's been more than a month since you ran Quicken. Please confirm your date settings, etc. Okay, so here we go. Now we're running. I'm going to just tell it quick because I don't really have a, a data file on it here. And I'll tell it to quick now. So Quicken 98 I can run. Um, think of other old programs. Specifically, I end up running a lot of stuff in old database programs. People will come to me and they say, I have this in Fox Pro, blah, 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 from 1986. I really want to get that data out of there. So this is a way where I can at least look and see what the data is and see what the capabilities of the program to export data are. And then there's all sorts of neat things you can do, like come back in, let's go to control panels, let's go to appearance. Um, oh, first thing I want to do is, of course, turn on my platinum sounds. And let's go to themes. Oh, let's pick a, let's pick a different theme here. Oh, do you remember Golden Poppy? Or uh, Lollipop? So I have the full functionality of a 1994 computer, and I can run the software for it. Now, let me do something else here real quick. Uh, now, I just did a command Q from my keyboard to quit disinfectant. And over here, I'm going to do a click on that, close that one out. Let's add another disk. So here I'm going to tell it to shut down. Okay. And we're going to go into our Sheep Shaper program. And I'm going to run a special program that lets me change the preferences for it without having to run the program. 
and I'm going to add a thing called games as a disk. I'm going to say open. And now I'm going to tell it to what? And relaunch. So here we go. We're back in Mac OS 9. Notice it kept the savings that I changed. So if I was running specialized software on it, things like make the chimes, China Reporter or whatever, all that stuff, would, it would remember what we did. Now I have a new disk. Oh, hello, Come on. where's my pointer? There we go. And it's called Games S. Let's see. Oh, hey, we got Stuck Copter in there. Let's, let's run Stuck Copter. Let's, let's run version 2. Okay, Stunt Copter by Dwayne Blem. <laughs> so here I am, navigating around. Oh, I dropped him. He hit the cloud, the and bomb. oh, oh that, that was bad. The new version has him spinning the basket under the helicopter. Okay. <laughs> All right, but this is software that's from the late 1980s that I'm running. Again, I'm running it on a modern machine. To me, this is miraculous. Okay, so let me tell it to shut down here and just do a quick recap. Quick shut down him. Oh. Notice how responsive it was. Okay. Well, I've got processors that were never even dreamed of when Mac OS 9 was written. So it's got plenty of resources. Okay. So when do you use stuff like this? When you've got something old data disks that you want to be able to access, old data on, for programs that no longer will run on anything that's sold in the store today. You set up an emulator, you bring it into there, find a copy of the program, boom, and you can get access to it, and usually you're able to export it. To save it out of some sort of file that you can then bring into your modern machine and put it into a, a newer database uh, package. Or you've got games that you really, really love from back then. There's a, a game called Jewel Box from Barcom. It only runs in 256K, you know, 256 colors. Well, in Mac OS 9, running in Mojave, I can say, hey, don't give me millions, billions, millions, thousands. Give me just 256 colors. It changes the virtual monitor in Mac OS 9, and I can play that game again. Where if I try to do it any other way, Mojave's going to say, I don't do 256 colors. I only do millions and billions. You can't run. And it just wouldn't work. So again, it's a way that you can be able to run games from the past be able to access data from the past. And in some cases, the programs that were written back then were just more efficient and did the job better. So sometimes you just have a workhorse that really did the job for you, and you'll run it in an emulator because it's a more productive way to do that particular task. So today we showed you how to do classic Macintosh machines. There are other emulators for Commodore computers, Atari computers, Amiga computers, um, I'm trying to remember all the other, the Superbit jobs are out there. Emulators for IBM Vaxes, you know, they're souped up IBM 360s. Emulators for PDP, digital uh, data core PDP machines. So, and it works on the modern stuff. Okay, so with that said, any last questions before I release you back into the wild? <laughs>
There's, yeah. There, this may be kind of stupid, but I've been using open office. Mm -hmm. uh, I used to use Word years ago. And I just asked Chuck how to save an open office document in Word. Mm -hmm. So I did that. It shows up on my desktop. Mm -hmm. Looks fine, but open office more open it. So I went to my applications, chose my old Microsoft Word, which is four, mm -hmm. and it says, sorry, you can't open it because it's not supported. Now, is this the kind of thing that would help that? Okay. When you're working with modern documents, this is not going to help you with that. What, what's happened is, chances are you, that when you told it to save your document from open office, did you select Microsoft Word, a .doc file? Yes. Okay. And it shows up on my desktop like that. Okay. And your Microsoft Office is what year? Four. Four. Way, way back. Okay. Microsoft Office four. 2004, you mean? Yes. Microsoft Office 2004? Okay. Chances are it's saving it out as an XML format file instead of the slightly older format for Microsoft Office 2004, which would be a .doc file, not .docx. No, just .doc. Okay. What I'm going to suggest is, can you stay just a couple minutes after, and we'll take a look at it. Okay. Okay, because it really doesn't apply to the oh, okay. presentation. Well, then my next question would be, what about my Pac-Man game on, that I still have on my iBook? Would I be able to put that on? Do you know what it was, which operating system you have on the iBook? I don't remember. It's, it's okay, then what you want to do is, when you get home, the iBook still moves, right? It's, it still comes on. It's still yes. it's Turn it on. Go to your Apple. Go to About This Macintosh and see what operating system it's running on. Chances are we can run it in, in an emulator like this. Okay. That'll be fine. Okay. Anyone else wants to go twice? Then we are officially adjourned.